I just have a prayer request from one of our members. Um, many of you know Diane Palmer, and um, she's been out of town a little bit. Uh, she's down staying with her mother, and um, this is one of those situations that's just kind of tough. Her mom's body is worn out. She's in a great deal of pain, and um, she's ready to go home and be with the Lord. And uh, But her body just is, is keeps functioning. Yeah, I mean, she just keeps plugging along even though she's in so much pain. So Diane Palmer's asking us to pray for her. Um, as you know, it's, it's very taxing on the soul to watch someone you love suffer. And so I just thought we'd take a moment uh, before we get into the sermon this morning, which has a little bit to do with prayer, and uh, pray for this. And, and uh, let's just take a moment. Father, we all have people we love in our lives. And Father, we... Many of us have been through or someday will go through watching an, an older loved one uh, deal with pain. Father, we just pray for Diane Palmer and for Court and their family. And uh, we ask you, Lord, that you give her comfort and peace in these days. Uh, be with her mother, who has been a wonderful Christian woman all her life. Uh, had a real witness for you, uh, loved you. Lord, we pray for her, and uh, we pray for her peace, and we pray for her comfort. Father, uh, be with the family, and we thank you, Father, as you walk with them through these days. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is so nice to be back, like I said. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about soul preparation or soul prep. You know, we're into the whole Olympic thing right now, and uh, you watch these kids out there, and gosh, they look younger every year. I watch the Olympics. They're just babies. Even the old ones look young. But the amount of preparation that takes to be at that level of competition, it's just stunning. You know, I don't think it's even like it was even 50, 60 years ago. These kids practically train full-time it is their whole life. And you think about the way that they put all their energy and effort, mental, physical, even spiritual energy into this one discipline. The hours of training and time that go into it. And I'd ask you, how much do you give yourself to be prepared as a Christian for living your life. To witness God's goodness in this world and to be kingdom-minded, to think about what, Lord, is your will today. You know, I think that unfortunately we, we sometimes put it in the back pocket, sort of in reserve. It's We want it, but we don't always keep it out in front of us very well sometimes. And I think that there are things that kind of get in our way, and one of the things that gets in our way most often is a little issue we call forgiveness. Forgiveness is a challenge for a lot of us because we've suffered in life, we've felt pain, there's challenges in relationships, there are certainly problems. And, and forgiveness is this one area in our lives that if we, if I were to tell you there's one thing that you can do for yourself more than anything else that will help you be ready to be a kingdom person, it's forgiveness. Yes, reading the scriptures, yes, going to church, but if there's one thing that trips people up more than anything else, it's the issue of forgiveness, and especially towards somebody else. Now, just take a moment and think real simply. Think of that one person that you've had a hard time forgiving, that incident in your life that caused you enough pain that you severed a relationship. Or maybe you didn't sever it, but you still agonize over it. You still think about it. You still feel it. Or another way to put it is think about that relationship that you damaged 
that you brought hurt to, does that person still remind you of it every once in a while? Do you remember when you did this, when you said that? We all have probably got something that's rattling around in our head right now. Last week, Dan covered the Lord's Prayer. We said it this morning. From Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, this then is how you pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive our debtors or trespass, those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now that's where Dan stopped. Gave us a great understanding of the whole process that went into this translation. Gave us insight into the way this isn't a rote prayer, although it's easy to memorize, it's, it's comforting to us, but it is a model of prayer. It shows us how to pray. Jesus wants us to pray in a relationship with him. That it's not just something we do so that we get some magic checkbox in our day or somehow we fulfill something, but rather this is a model by which we approach our Heavenly Father in the most intimate of relationships where we speak to him and he in turn can speak to us. But then if we go into the scriptures, verses 14 and 15, what does Jesus say immediately after the Lord's Prayer, the most perhaps hallmark of prayer that Jesus has with his disciples as, he, as he's teaching them. What does he go into? Verses 14 and 15, this morning's scriptures. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive Give your sins. Wow. Do we take that seriously? Do you really take it seriously in your life that the consequence of not forgiving others means that God cannot or will not forgive you? Those are some very powerful words. That's a very challenging thought, for me at least. Because I know in the back of my mind and in the depth of my heart, there have been people who've hurt me, and I'm, you know, it wasn't ever so long ago that I had some experiences where it still hurts, where I still reside with a little bit of anger. And I, sometimes I like to go in there and muddle around in that. Do you ever find yourself doing that with somebody who's hurt you? you know, just go play in the anger. You know, we used to call it a pity party. But a pity party is a little too genteel. Quite frankly, it's mucking around in the mud. It's dirty. And it's a dark place. Because what's really happening there is you're going back and you're stirring an old wound. I always like to bring up this illustration. I got hit by a drunk driver one day and it caused me a nice wound in my hand. I lost a big chunk of flesh out of it. And that first night, boy, that puppy hurt. It even hurt more when they stuck a bunch of needles in it so it wouldn't hurt anymore. And the next day when those needles, uh, when that Novocaine was gone, I could feel all those little needles as well as that big wound. And the next week, it hurt. A month later, if I grabbed something, it would hurt. Six months later, I would grab something just the right way, and it would just go right through my body. A year later, if I pressed on it, I could feel it. And now, it's a story. Healed. But I still see the scar on my hand there. And I know what happened so many years ago. Now, I didn't know that man. So really, there's not much there to deal with. My anger towards him subsided, went away. I even forgave him. 
and it's gone past me. But there are other scars on my soul that even though they've been there for years and years, sometimes I like to go back and kind of pry at them. And it's my own fault. It's my own doing. It's, it's not them. But I find myself having a hard time sometimes letting go. And I think that that's the challenge for us. I've had people who have literally told me as a pastor, I cannot forgive. How can God expect me to forgive my ex-husband who did, and they could name off a laundry list of brokenness. How can God expect me to forgive my mother who did these things to me? How can God ever forgive or expect me to forgive a father who did X, Y, and Z to me? Or the man who murdered my child? I've seen all those in the years that I've been pastoring. And I hear the pain in people who truly want to worship and know God, but don't know how yet to let go. And yet, if we take seriously the scriptures and what Jesus says, if you do not forgive, then God cannot forgive you. If we take that seriously, we have to see that somehow in God's power, there is a way to get out of the muck and get to where it's just a story. There are a lot of examples in the scriptures about forgiveness. In the previous set of passages in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, in the middle of the Lord's prayer, Lord, forgive us our debts. We go to God and we ask him, Lord, I know I'm broken. I know that I need to be forgiven. I need you to forgive me so that I can have a chance for eternal peace and rest and life. The only way that I get to spend eternity with God is through Jesus Christ and by his power be forgiven of my sins. Oh, I'm good with wanting that, God. I'm really good. I want you to forgive my sins, Lord. Please forgive my sins. And I'm good at asking because I sin regularly. You know, little mental issues, little thoughts, little spurts of anger or selfishness or whatever it is. There's, there's my brokenness is all over the place. I'm good at going to God and asking him to forgive me. I'm even somewhat good at going to people I've hurt and asking for forgiveness. But then there are those people that fall into this. As we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, forgive us our debts. That's interesting because the, the Greek there says... Lord, forgive us our debts, not only the past, but forgive us our future. But in this next little line, as we also have forgiven our debtors, Christ is assuming that if you are truly his, you will follow his example, you will forgive. You will. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that you have. But Christ has the power to help you forgive. Even when it doesn't feel comfortable, even when it hurts. Even when it's fresh in your mind, or it's a 40-year-old memory. Christ can untie you from the past, and he has the power to do so. You might also remember the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35, the little story about the man who owed his master a tremendous amount of debt. And the master calls him into account for it, and he comes in and begs and pleads, please, please don't throw me in prison, don't throw my family in prison. I'll, I'll pay you, somehow I'll pay you. And the master has pity on him and forgives him his debt. 
And he no sooner walks out of his master's presence than he sees another fellow servant who owes him just a small, small amount. And he chokes the man and says, you'll repay me everything. His fellow servants see what he does and goes back to report to the master. And the master retrieves his forgiveness from him and throws him into prison. Now, if that's Christ's picture of God, that can challenge us a bit. Can God retrieve his forgiveness? We play interesting theological games with that question. Can God retrieve his forgiveness from us if we have claimed Christ? I'm challenged to believe that that's true. But what I can believe is that maybe we haven't had an experience with Christ to understand forgiveness in the first place. If you are incapable of forgiving someone, it's probably because you haven't yet been forgiven yourself. Have you asked him genuinely to be your Lord and Savior? Because if you ask him to be your Savior, yes, you're asking him for your forgiveness. If you're asking him to be your Lord and Savior, it means you're willing to submit your life to his will. There's some theological hurdles there too, but I believe in the end, when you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, when you truly know who he is, and when you truly experience the depth of his love and compassion and forgiveness, you can't help, no matter how deep or foul the wound is, you eventually, by his spirit, by his power, are able to let it go. You can forgive. Jesus has numerous other teachings on forgiveness, but I want to take one to where we were this morning. We took communion together. When Jesus gives this cup to his disciples for the first time, he says in Matthew 26, he then took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it all or drink from it all of you This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When I think about forgiveness, I think about its costs. What is it to me to forgive someone who's harmed me, even a great deal? Well, It's a mental exercise. It can be a physical exercise and it's definitely a spiritual exercise. Mental, I say to myself, I forgive you. And I think that this is one of the very first things we have to understand. It is a confessional point of reference. When that person hurts you and they hurt you then, As a Christian, you should know mentally the first thing you have to do is forgive. Even in the moment. To simply make an acknowledgement that I forgive you. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it feels forgiven. Remember the illustration of the scar? It may hurt still. But give it time. Just like we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and yet do not see him today, we believe that he will come back one day. We believe also that should we perish before he comes back, that we will go into his presence. That when I confess Jesus, the reality isn't here right now except by the power of his Spirit, which we receive when we accept Jesus Christ but that one day that confession will bear out its power and its truth. And I believe the same is true of forgiveness. When you forgive someone, even though the relationship may still be broken or strained, you've begun the process of forgiveness and healing. When you let go by beginning with the first words, I forgive, 
You give yourself and this person the power of moving past the hurt. How deep was the cost of forgiveness? While he was still on the cross and the Roman guards were gambling for his clothing, while they were uttering insults towards him, for they do not know what they are doing. I don't know of a situation yet that has cost me really much more than a little bit of blood every once in a while. I bled pretty good when I got hit by the drunk driver. Most of my wounds are mentally challenging, even somewhat spiritually challenging, but they've never cost me my life. The depth to which Christ had to go to say, Father, forgive them, in that moment while they were splitting up his his clothing as they were throwing dice for his robe, was a moment in which he was hanging by his wrists and his ankles on a tree for us. That's how deep and painful And that's the depth by which forgiveness comes through Christ. So let me ask you, have you ever said, I can't forgive someone? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever thought that? You know, I just don't know how I can forgive you. And you compare what Christ was going through on the cross. And I ask you, how can How can you not forgive? I want to go to an interesting example. Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. It's a story about a man. One of the very first men. Chapter 4 starts out, Adam, this is the New International Version, I don't remember what the King James says, probably something uh, he knew his wife. But Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He replied. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And of course, this passage and story goes on a little further. But think about this for just a moment. Two brothers. Do you think over the course of their lifetime they hadn't hurt one another in some way? I suspect so. I got two boys in my household. They're constantly beating on each other. One more so than the other. 
And there are times when there are tears that are shed and there are words that are exchanged and there are feelings that are hurt. And as, I, as they grow up, I suspect that there will continue to be brotherly challenges. But in the story of Cain and Abel, Cain's the older brother. And here comes along this other pup, Abel. There's no commentary to lead us to believe that Adam and Eve treated one over the other better. But in ancient cultures, the older brother always got everything at the end of his parents' life. This is the guy who's... He has it all. He's got it all. He's the one who's going to get it all. And let's go to this thing because I think we're battery must be dying. Boom, 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 boom. So what we have here is a picture of Cain working the fields. And you know, that's, that's pretty difficult work to go out and hoe and rake. And of course, you know, this is after the garden, so he's dealing with weeds. I don't know about you, but I planted a garden this year. I can see my corn, and I can see the mustard. It's the strangest thing. Gardening is hard work. Shepherding, I don't know so much. Just trounce around after a bunch of animals, make sure that they're eating, getting watered. I'm sure there's, it's difficult, but, I, you know, it, it, to me, going out and having to rototill, chop, dig, weed, chop, dig, weed, chop, dig, weed, over and over until you finally got a tomato that big. <laughs> and that's my tomato patch this year. I'm telling you, I went away on vacation, and all my tomatoes decided to go away on vacation too. So, but here we are, there's something between Cain and Abel. And it shows up finally in its ultimate form. They each bring their offerings to God and Cain brings out his fruit and Abel brings out the meat and the fat and God looks with favor. We don't get an explanation why God favors the meat over the produce. Obviously, God's not vegan. But whatever happens here, God favors one. And for some reason, that causes Cain distress. Maybe it's sibling rivalry. Who knows what it is? But for some reason, Cain is distressed. And God sees it in him and goes to him and says, Why are you angry? Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If what you do is right, if what you do is right, will you not be accepted? Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. This is the first sin noted for us in Scripture outside of what took place in the garden. It's envy. And that little bit of envy, I think, builds itself into something that Cain wasn't able to manage. Cain wasn't able to let go. And who knows where Cain's real anger was? Maybe it was his jealousy towards his brother. His brother has done him up one more time. Sometimes I think that his anger is towards God. And I want to touch on that point real quick for a lot of you because I think that sometimes we, in our lives, experience these moments when we're in such deep pain and our soul is so hurt that we look to heaven and say, where are you and why do you let this happen to me? Is anybody willing to to say, hey, I've been there too? 
so in distress, so pained in our soul that we literally are angry at God. And all I can say is that's just like being a parent, which, you know, we speak of God as our Heavenly Father. It's a perfect illustration. My kids have been mad at me for no fault of my own. (laughs) You know, I get hit with a lot of requests. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And eventually at the end of the day, sometimes I just have to flat say no. And all of a sudden I've got a bad attitude in a kid who's mad at me and I haven't done anything except say this isn't the right time for that or it's not going to happen at all. And God sometimes has to say that to us. And in our weakness, in our inability to understand God's vision and purpose in our lives, sometimes we get mad at him. I don't know that I'm prepared to say that we need to learn to forgive God. But I think that sometimes, because that implies as if he has done something wrong. But sometimes we need to let go. But when it comes to other people and we are distressed in our relationship with them, we have to forgive. And I think Cain in this story is not only angry at God, but he is especially angry at his brother. And when God says that sin is crouching at your door and you must rule over it, I don't think he's saying to Cain, you have to have this mental gymnastics where you get past whatever issue you have. Get your head on right. Go see a counselor. No, you have to rule over it. And I think that honestly, the only thing that we have that helps us to rule over our hurts, real or imagined, is forgiveness. It is saying I forgive. And sometimes, maybe as in this case, I need to forgive myself. You know what? I think Cain's at the root of the whole problem here. It's not Abel, and it's not God. It's something in Cain that wants to be mad that wants to be injured, that wants to be hurt, that wants to hold it over his brother's head, and he doesn't. He doesn't let it go, and guess what happens? He goes out and murders his brother. Coming unburdened. The benefits of forgiveness are huge. First, there's a relief from emotional stress. I think that when we do not forgive people, it winds us up inside. When you haven't let go, it tears you up. And you know the funny thing I've noticed over the course of the years in my experience with forgiving other people is most of the time when I finally get it to that point where I realize that I am hanging on to this way too tight, they've already let it go and they've walked away from it. I go and say, you know what, as a good Christian, I need to talk to you because, man, I, I, I need to forgive something here. You hurt me some time ago, and, and I've been just mulling this over. And they're looking at me like I'm coming from outer space. You're still upset with that? Yeah, I am. Oh, geez, I moved on from that years ago. Oh, great. Lucky you. I'm out here feeling it still. But what do I take away from that? What I take away from that is forgiveness isn't as much for them as it is for me. When I forgive other people, it does two things. First, it rightens my relationship with God. Forgive others, because if you don't, I can't forgive you. Somehow I put a barrier between me and God. So when I forgive somebody else, I'm getting straight my relationship with Christ. Number two, I'm getting my relationship straight with other people. And you know, they, 
oddly enough, have said to me things like, geez, I wondered why our relationship wasn't very good, why we weren't as close as we used to be. It wasn't that they didn't want it to be a good friendship. I couldn't let it be a good friendship anymore. I was the one holding, I was the problem. I was Cain. I was Cain in that moment. Forgiveness also relieves physical stress. The researchers at the University of Tennessee, uh, Dr. Warren Jones and Kathleen Lawyer, found that harboring anger and resentment tends to increase blood pressure. Oh, gee whiz, what a shock. And I'll bet the government gave them about $5 million to do that, although it didn't say in the paper. They say forgiving seems to have an overall cardiovascular benefit. Well, it's good for your heart. The Bible tells us that. A study conducted at the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research found that forgiving others was linked with better reported um, mental and physical health. Boy, yeah. Again, we know. Forgiveness creates freedom from the pain of the past. Forgiveness doesn't change the past. I think this is one thing that people really get hung up on. You cannot change the past, but you can change the way you relate to it. I want to share it with you, and I've shared this story many years ago, but I want to read you a wonderful story about forgiveness from a professor that I had at Fuller Theological Seminary. I'd like you to just sort of let yourself get that place where you can kind of close your eyes and just listen to the words and hear this story. But it's a beautiful illustration of forgiveness. It's called The Magic Eyes, A Little Fable by Dr. Lewis Smedes. Happened to be sitting in his classroom the day that the book was published, the story is in, and he told this story verbatim. It was just an amazing experience. And I hope that you take away from this a little insight of forgiveness for yourself. In the village of Fakin, in the innermost Friesland, there lived a long, thin baker named Folke, a righteous man with a long, thin chin and a long, thin nose. Folke was so upright that he seemed to spray righteousness from his thin lips over everyone who came near him. So the people of Fakin preferred to stay away. Folke's wife, Hilda, was short and round. Her arms were round, her bosom was round, her rump was round. Hilda did not keep people at bay with righteousness. Her soft roundness seemed to invite them in instead, to come closer to her in order to share the warm cheer of her open heart. Hilda respected her righteous husband and loved him too, as much as he allowed her. But her heart ached for something more than his worthy righteousness. And there in the bed of her nade lay the seed of sadness. One morning, having worked since dawn to knead his bread for the ovens, Folke came home and found a stranger in his bedroom laying with Hilda. Hilda's adultery soon became the talk of the tavern and the scandal of the Fakin congregation. Everyone assumed that Folke would cast Hilda out of his house, so righteous was he. But he surprised everyone by keeping Hilda as his wife, saying he forgave her as the good book said he should. In his heart of hearts, however, Folke could not forgive Hilda for bringing shame to his name. Whenever he thought about her, his feelings towards her were angry and hard. He despised her as if she were a common whore. And when it came right down to it, he hated her for betraying him after he had been so good and so faithful a husband to her. He only pretended to forgive Hilda so that he could punish her with his righteous mercy. But Folke's fakery 
did not sit well in heaven. So each time Folky would feel his secret hatred towards Hilda, an angel came to him and dropped a small pebble, hardly the size of a shirt button, into Folky's heart. Each time a pebble dropped, Folky would feel a stab of pain like the pain he felt the moment he came home on Hilda, feeding her hungry heart from a stranger's larder. Thus he hated her the more, and his hate brought him more pain, and his pain made him hate. The pebbles multiplied, and Folky's heart grew very heavy with the weight of them, so heavy that the top half of his body bent forward so far that he would have to strain his neck upward in order to see straight ahead. Weary with hurt, Folky began to wish he were dead. The angel who had dropped the pebbles into his heart came to Folky one night and told him how he could be healed of his hurt. There is one remedy, he said, only one for the hurt of a wounded heart. Folky would need the miracle of the magic eyes. He would need eyes that could look back to the beginning of his hurt and see Hilda not as a wife who betrayed him, but as a weak woman who needed him. Only a new way of looking at things through the magic eyes could heal the hurt flowing from the wounds of yesterday. Folky protested. Nothing can change the past. He said, Hilda is guilty, a fact that not even an angel can change. Yes, poor hurting man, you are right, said the angel. You cannot change the past. You can only heal the hurt that comes to you from the past. And you can heal it only with the vision of the magic eyes. And how can I get your magic eyes, pouted Folky? Only ask. Desiring as you ask, and they will be given to you. And each time you see Hilda through your new eyes, one pebble will be lifted from your aching heart. Folky could not ask at first. For he had grown to love his hatred but the pain of his heart finally drove him to want and to ask for the magic eyes that the angel had promised. So he asked, and the angel gave. Soon Hilda began to change in front of Folky's eyes, wonderfully and mysteriously. He began to see her as a needy woman who loved him instead of a wicked woman who had betrayed him. The angel kept his promise. He lifted the pebbles from Folky's heart one by one, though it took a long time to take them all away. Folky gradually felt his heart grow lighter, and he began to walk up straight again, and somehow his nose and his chin seemed less thin and sharp than before. He invited Hilda to come into his heart again, and she came, and together they began Again, a journey into their second season of humble joy. Forgiveness comes at a great cost. It comes when we decide to let go and follow the very example that Jesus set for us. To forgive when others don't deserve it. To forgive because we're the ones who benefit the most from forgiving. Christ gained the glory of the highest position in heaven. He gained a new family, those who would call upon his name. And he will receive eternal praise as we sing to his glory for all of eternity. We, his followers need to be just like him. Take that person, that time, that event, that moment that hurts you, that weighs your heart down, and see that person through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Forgive so you can be forgiven. Forgive so you can be healed. Forgive so that your relationship with Christ is not hindered in any way. And forgive because he forgave you.
Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for the beautiful lesson of forgiveness, for challenging us mentally and especially spiritually, Father. That when we say we can't, we know we can because we have you on our side. And Lord, help us, even in the middle of our anger and our hurt and our frustration, to let go and trust ourselves to you and your control in our lives so that we can witness the freedom that we have in Christ. Thank you, Father, for your love and your healing in our lives, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand with me, and we're going to sing one last song as we go out this morning. And we have that potluck this morning, so I'm going to invite you to come on out and